I'll partly look at you, and I'll partly look at the slides. But since you've been sitting for a while, what I'd like you to do for a moment is just meet each other in a different way. And what I'd like you to do is just stand up, turn to the person behind you, because the person next to you already have met. <laughs> and now just shake their hands and introduce them. Since I only have 20 minutes, it's a very short introduction. So I'll let you sit again. I'll let you all just sort of stop introducing each other. Good luck. You've let the genie out of the bottle. I know. And then I would just simply ask a couple of questions. One, just the act of standing and meeting somebody else, did your subjective energy increase a bit? Did you become less sleepy? Yes. Notice we're talking about inner state, and yet the most obvious inner state we forget is body and movement. Most of us have sitting disease, and thereby will develop numerous other illnesses because of that. Just a simple task of getting up and doing something else. And remember, our brain was developed not for thinking from animals, not for cognition, just for motor coordination. And that's all. And if you take in, ma in some animals who start as an animal, then become almost like a plant, then they reabsorb their brain. And we are not that different, so please do use your body. But that was not the question I came up to talk about or think about. What was the purpose? Well, there are a couple of purposes I could ask you at all for time and efficiency. I'll talk, I'll state them. One, social networking. Two, you all shook hands. You all communicated with each other. What did you observe? How wet was the hand or how moist? How dry? How much did the person squeeze it? When they spoke, what was their breathing pattern? Notice those are all nonverbal cues which are very low tech and yet very high tech because they truly affect each other. And we're all individuals. So in the moment of one handshake, I should be able to do a stressor analysis. I would know, are you a skin reactor called by skin conductance? Are you, do you tend to be a vasomotor reactor by getting cold hands? Do you tend to be slightly fearful? <laughs> Or are you going to go, huh? and it depends on the culture, because in some cultures you shake your hands and it feels like the arm is ripped off. And when I go to Asia, it's this kind of a soft hand, so you have to contextualize it in culture. But what did you observe out of this? You would have already done a whole physiological analysis. And then posture. We talked about mood. One of the best correlations with depression is body posture. The moment you take someone and collapse them a tiniest bit, they have more access to negative, hopeless, helpless, powerful, defeated thoughts that, than if they are erect. Very simple. So all the technologies that look at posture, I highly push for because it is a boundary where it's motor activity interaction. Okay, let me quickly go uh, on the next slide. Let me try. See, just to listen to yourself. That's all the, the technology is about. And I do want to go back to that one because it makes the invisible visible. That's the message I want to give, basically. In many cases, we are communicating, our bodies are reacting, and we're totally unaware. Okay, and this is based upon a psychophysiology, psychophysiological principle by Elmer Lee Green. Basically, every thought, emotion, cognition affects body, and every body change affects cognitions and emotions. It's a two-way street, that's all. So maybe what I'll do there are many ways we can, I want to show how we react, that's one. Let, let's look, see how we react to external stimuli for a moment. If you can show the video clip. What did you experience? 
Some of your heart rate went up, not all. Some went down, in fact. If you gave, yes, it's hard to believe. If you thought this was truly life-threatening, your heart rate would slow down, you withdraw. Some of you now said, oh, that was fun. <laughs> and if some of you had a post-traumatic stress history, you would now be activated for a long time. All different. So the next message I have, all the data we look at in science, especially evidence-based medicine, is group data, group averages. We are individual responders. Let me give this, okay? Remember the stimuli evokes an orienting or defense reaction, they're totally different. You know, and probably from my research areas or way of thinking, shifting in breathing patterns is a better predictor of almost anything. We talked about Dick Averse talking about six breaths a minute, bringing resonance. Ch any change in breathing will affect your health or is a measurable tool. You gasp, you hold your breath, you give a sigh of relief. Some of you have been inspired by, will be inspired by this talk, and others will just be expired. <laughs> uh, and hope that, you know, that I'm not full of hot air. Uh, okay, let me just look at, if I look at the subject, here's an example subject on this recording. And there are hundreds of them, and everybody's different, and there are themes, but I wanted to make two parts on this which may be useful. Let me explain this graph for a moment. The top blue line is the chest breathing pattern. Up and down shows the breathing pattern of the chest. The, the reddish line is the breathing pattern in the abdomen. So this person is, is a very good diaphragmatic breather. It worked out, which I didn't know. The person is superb because he's a yoga instructor. The next line, is the, um, that has kind of yellow tones in it, you know, sort of white. That is the pulse. It's the pulse amplitude. It measures, the, the, the thickness of it measures the blood, how did that, it measures the diameter in the sense of how much blood is flowing through the tissue. And you can extract out the heart rate. And the bottom line is, is your skin conductance. The old term used to be galvanic skin response, which measured it in ohms, a measure of resistance. The new term is really uh, skin conductance. It measures how much the skin will conduct electricity. And that's the bottom line. And the reason I brought this slide up because I think it's one of the more interesting responses. And I wish I could make, you can, you can amply see it. What you can see here, this is the person reacts. You can see the blood flow, the person is relaxing. This is lovely, being peaceful. The hands are getting warmer, that's this line. You know, and then the video goes on. This is called the orienting response in that sense. They orient at this moment. It worked out that I made a mistake in this subject, so we didn't, we showed the video clip just for a moment, then we started it again. Okay, so they saw the first part of this lovely car passing by twice. So here they see the car passing, so now we start again, they get this nice, and you see they're starting to relax again. And now they get this ghost response. And this, and if you like the skin conductance measures, you see this is the baseline, you could say they're relaxing. They respond a tiny bit to the, to the stimuli, they relax more. Now they give a very big response. And many of you would do that. Then you would giggle for a moment, and then the system recovers. However, it is recovering for her, it looks like, somewhat. Here, she, all these little bumps are her making judgments about herself inside. And what is most interesting, if you could look at this line here, because she is really unique in this sense, is this narrowing of the pulse, the height of the pulse. That means the blood vessels were con state constricted. And if you run this record out for a half an hour, which we did do, in this case, this vasoconstriction never disappeared. I was equally shocked and surprised. Her skin conductance really went all the way down pretty well. And it worked out as a little girl, she psychology, she was terrified of ghosts in her culture. This evoked it and brought back all those terrifying memories. And here she's just struggling time and time again, trying to let go. And even though she's highly trained, she could not easily do that. And her breathing pattern, for most people who look at breathing, they would say, that doesn't look so abnormal. Because most people respond differently. So here is the next message on this for me. If you wanted to record skin conductance, this measure, you can't tell if it's pleasure or fear. <laughs> Shucks. 
It's, it can be an orienting response or a defense reaction, as long as it's sympathetic arousal. And you could say during use stress you get a response. You get a very big response if you giggled and laughed. <laughs> That'd be easy. Also during fear. However, the blood vessels in the fingers are probably a perfect co-variable. And if you see you have skin conductance going up and responding, and the pulse amplitude decreases and goes down, you're pretty, or you're pretty sure that is a d an emotional state of fear or pulling away defense reaction. And that seems to be consistent among all the, the students, our clients, or patients we see. You cannot tell that from the skin conductance. Let me do uh, one or two more slides like this. Let me, I want to point out that we are reacting in all our systems. That's the major part. Here is just thinking of a stressor. Again, a complicated slide. We, s we look at multiple systems. Okay, so here you can see it. Br uh, this is respiration. You have chest and you have, I'm sorry, uh, this line, what it shows here is skin conductance. That's that very light line here. The upper one is that you could say is the blood volume pulse. That's the diameter of your fingers. Or you could say it's your finger temperature indirectly. Here's the person's breathing pattern for a moment. Here's their pulse, their heartbeat, as measured by, vo by photoplethys from the fingers. And here's their heart rate derived from that. And now the person sits normally here. We teach them a bit slower breathing. They get a nicer heart rate variability, which Dick Birch talked about, but you get in that resonance, it's a little slow. Now we ask the person to simply think of a little stressor. The first thing you really see is that respiration changes. And that's the most common one. They either shallow breathe, they gasp, the heart rate goes up, the pulse amplitude goes down, and you can see the co how these patterns co-vary and skin conductance goes up. This happens to be some of the high responder because every breath the person does, you see the skin conductance going up. All of a sudden, you see these multiple patterns. This is this person. Another person may not give the same pattern. Oh, shucks. <laughs> okay, and this one I just like because I happen to do this at a meeting. We, took a, we want to show how thoughts affect the body. And so here we have a young psychologist she is 26 years, 25 years old. We asked her to sit. She sits very relaxed. We monitor her muscles. And remember, when you're thinking, your muscles are activated. It's only when your, your brain is empty, your muscles are not activated. It may not be in your forearm. It may be in your throat. Somewhere you'll have activation. And in her case, all we asked her to do is to sit and now imagine playing the piano. She has training as a classical pianist. And I want to point out here, you see the physiological recording very nicely. Here she's sitting. I would bet my whole budget that if you looked at the video of her, you wouldn't see a muscle twitch with your eye. None. No therapist had ever seen it. I want to be very clear. You don't. And, however, when you put EMG sensors on the skin, it does react. And here, this is what she said. Here she is relaxed. Here she manages playing one piece. She relaxes and manages playing another piece. This data is overwhelming. Some of you res respond in your arms. Some of you respond. As long as it's, it is a motor pattern, you may get a connection. And what the most important part is for her, and this is something what the feedback does, my arm did not move. Everybody who looked at her said it didn't move. Yet the service EMG increase when I mentally rehearsed playing the piano. I did not, you know, it really made me aware how my thoughts affected my body. That's the first step to doing, making a, 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 a change. How can I think? What are you thinking at each time? To me, that is a message at least. Okay, so just as a side note, what I was really looking forward to here, I hope next time I come, I'll see that, that there are going to be many, many little buttons I can put on my muscles which I can monitor my cell phone, or when I tighten them, they will vibrate and remind me to relax. Because when I work on my cell phone or computer, I sit like this, and by the end of the day, I'm tired. And except I have no idea I'm doing it. So hopefully, uh, there are some easy apps for cell phones. There are some being developed, they're just not here, because everybody sees the efficacy to be the EEG as a general rule. 
and yet muscles is a giant system we react and easily controllable. Okay, here, now moving to skin conductance, and this fits very much with the election, sadly to say. And here's the impact of an unwanted uh, sexual attention. <laughs> we do this always as demos, I'm sorry. It works very well, I could have, and if anybody wants to do it later, I brought the equipment with me, we can hook any of you up, male or female, it almost makes no difference. And all you do is you sit here, you're sitting comfortably, and here, at this point, you say to the person, not to that person, you say, could you please come up here and give this person a kiss? And it makes no difference, it's obviously embarrassment. The amplitude could be the meaning, how much I like the person. I'm not gonna, you know, I cannot tell whether the person likes the person or not. It could be a fear reaction, or, oh my God, it's so pleasurable. I don't know. <laughs> you, can, you know, it's, and that's it. Here you can see, the person did give a kind of, fear, I would, for that person, more fear reaction. Then you can see how their brain is almost working still. Is it, you know, what's gonna go on, what's going on, you know, how we do this? And then they realize, okay, it's all, I'm, not, I'm never gonna be kissed. Uh, shoo, I let go, and now we have recovery. And note how long the recovery takes. And for most people, the moment you get that stimulus, you can account for at least 90 seconds or longer before the system rejects comes back, and what most of us do, 90 seconds is an infinite time. Especially try to change your words. You want to say, I want to be relaxed now. No, it takes at least 90 seconds. Okay, let's see. The main points, for this segment at least, there's significant individual differences in, in, the, re in the response and the recovery. And I tried to uh, allude with the person with the kind of post-traumatic stress in the history, uh, the recovery took so long. Two. Some people respond only mainly with muscle tension, others with heart rate, others with sweating, others with lowering or raising blood pressure, lowering or raising heart rate, and some combination. There in, and there are individual differences in stimuli. I remember doing EEG work in the 19, late 1960s, where we showed visual displays, looking at the effect on, on the EEG, but, and the EEG drove the visual display. And we had males in the VA, so we used somewhat erotic pictures. So when they would look at it, they would get oriented each time. And you could plot this curve. It worked for nine out of 10 persons. One person got no response, but they get a great response to our neutral slide of a flower. <laughs> and that's strange. <laughs> and luckily, I in deep debrief every person and I asked, what are you doing? And then we found out that the last person who did not show the expected response had just come back from a honeymoon. I think he didn't want to see anybody anymore. And, at the, and his hobby was horticulture, and he didn't know what flower it was. That, and that taught me a lot. For some of you, imagine being at the beach. Ah, oh, Hawaii, most, oh, it's great. Or the big, you know, off Australia. And then one or two of you, the only image that pops up is the shark. It isn't relaxing. And we need to remember those, Im those important differences. Just for electro, now I'll move very quick to skin conductance in a very short moment. It's just the, the, sk the skin's ability to conduct current, that's all. Okay, and there are a number of terms for this. The classic one is galvanic skin response, that is the old term. The, that it measures in ohms resistance. The newer term for the last 20 years is skin conductance. And then the one no one uses is, electric, is skin potential. You measure the potential difference in the palm usually and the forearm. That's the only one that can tell you the difference whether it's an orienting response, like ah, what's new, versus a defense reaction. The other two do not usually show that. That's the work by Sokolov. Uh, let's see, it's been well established since the 1880s. I would say it's a very low-tech technique. It's great in that sense. It was used by Freud, by Wilhelm Reich. By it can be used as a lie detector. It's the basis of the E-meter in Scientology. Uh, but the most important part, it doesn't discriminate between positive or negative affect usually. Okay, you can put it usually on your palms. You want to put it where you perspire most. And usually the fingertips and the palmar surface or in your feet have the most sweat glands. That's what you're measuring. You can also put it underneath your uh, axle, you know, your armpits, and they also work. However, there's no research on that. I keep thinking I want a shirt maybe that could tell me that all the time and train people that way. 
Okay. It is possible to teach people to inhibit it or to increase it. Okay. But I said it mainly measures the responses whenever there is sympathetic activation. And the intent and what is resulting, the intensity of the stimuli and the subjective meaning of that stimuli, that's the critical part, that affects the response and the recovery. And then it depends on your physiology where you uh, tend to respond a lot or little. So there's a real, there's a high individual differences. You can group people very simplistically in three categories. That's the work by Marjorie Tooman done in the 70s. She talks about people who respond to everything, called high responders. Any stimulus, their skin goes, they, they start sweating. They take a big breath, and they feel it. All of you, just take a big breath and then go. Oh, you can do it even better than that. One more time. And now can you feel the tingling going down your arms and legs? Some of you feel amazing. How many can feel tingling? See, not everybody as much chucks. There goes any study. That's individual difference again. But for, but for those who felt the tingling, I'll promise you, your skin conductance went way up. And for some of you, it stays up a long time. Because if you don't like the tingling, or you worry, oh my God, this is something, then my brain keeps activating it. That's a problem of some of the feedback systems. Because if you take them home, you don't know it, all you know, is that you're reacting. You need to teach the person to be aware, and you need to teach them a skill to change it. And without that skill, you, you make an escalating discomfort. Okay, let's see. Here's the classic, rec the, the recording she would do this way, very simply. Here you can see this, the recording going down. Here the person has an emotional thought, they reacted. Some react very little, some react very much. It's just a delta change, it's very relative. They recover, but really this recovery would be a line that would go down, 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 down till here maybe before they've recovered. Before they recover, there's another reacting reaction. So it's, an, it's a challenging system, it's both a great system and sometimes challenging. Remember, in terms of the neural connection of this, it's our sympathetic nervous system, if the, if a parasympathetic neurotransmitter that causes us to perspire a bit more. Keep in mind on that physiology that if the person takes drugs, anything that's sympathetic mimic will tend to increase the response or the sweatiness. Anything that is inhibitory will reduce it. And let's see. We already did the experience of the sigh for a moment. Uh, let's see what else I can do. Here's where sighing occurs time and time again with a patient. And you can see every time the person sighs on this slide here, this, this is skin conductance. This is the muscle tension of the shoulders. They have no idea they're doing this, by the way. They're totally unaware they're sighing. They're totally unaware their body is responding. This person has a kind of fibromyalgia. And every time they sigh, they get this autonomic arousal, almost autonomic storm in that sense. They needed to learn to inhibit that and to change their cognitive patterns. Okay, I talked about the reactors already. The uses, I'm gonna be very simplistic from my perspective. It's one of the greatest demonstrations to show mind-body relationships. Or to external stimuli or internal stimuli. And for so many, especially in Silicon Valley, men, they love numbers and graphs. This is the cheapest device I know you can use to make that relationship. Once you make that, you can start saying, well, maybe you want to do breathing techniques. You may want to start thinking in a different way, etc." Two, you can use as a great tool to identify you are reacting. The signal is two seconds usually behind the actual occurrence. So if I clap, oh, I should do it loud, right? Two seconds later, the line would go up because it takes about two seconds for the signal to be processed to pass down to allow the acetylcholine to go to get the sweat glands to let the sweat go up and to change the, the skin conductance. So it's always two seconds behind the actual event, approximately two seconds. If you're little, maybe it's a little short, okay? So it can be used. You can use it each time you react potentially to learn not to react. 
to help identify the sources why you're reacting, what is causing it externally, internally, and then potentially you can interrupt that pattern. You can monitor the efficacy of techniques by which you are going to be really quiet. Some of the meditative techniques, if the mind and emotions are quiet, the skin conductance line will tend to be flat. However, in emotional relationships, you don't want to have a flat line. It's not very fun for your partner, okay? And you can use it to, to really train specific increase or decrease. So there is data to show that skin conductance training can be used as a treatment for hypertension. It can be done to treat anxieties, desensitizations in structured ways. And in fact, the opposite side is used a number of times in very good studies to increase arousal to interrupt seizures because seizures is, it, is the spreading out of that of the deep of the of, of involving more and more of the cortex or the brain and now you're reactivating some other parts and you shut it off it's very elegant work let's see i had a project i think i'm getting close to it so this is the real logic yes here's the concept really is here's where you're ha happy or whatever somehow you become aware usually we are not aware of the body sensations the cognitive sensations till we have symptoms that's way over here somewhere Instead, you want to become aware earlier. That's where the feedback can help you. And then you can do interventions techniques. And if you do that, numerous disorders disappear and your health may be significantly improved. And finally, I think I'll end with this, the potential for variables. I think what is really helpful is to give feedback to the body person. I think all of you know that. Really, people need to really know how to use them. That's the, I see the biggest challenge when we use them with, with students, with clients, they use the variables. Half the time, some of my instruction sets and the box wasn't good enough. <laughs> we have to come, come back and reintroduce all the times when there are artifacts or things that doesn't work. I do think there are many skills you want to teach the person that is part of many of the variables to, to reduce arousal, making the assumption the problem is excessive arousal. Some people are too low, okay? But it includes slow breathing, relaxation mastery skills, you know, redirecting focus of attention, cognitive reframing, problem solving, you have a whole long list. And personally, I think it is a combination. And the most powerful techniques for me are areas of respiratory patterns. I already cited the amplitude of the pulse and the final one of muscle. And I think I would recommend there are a number of societies, scientific societies that are involved in research and clinical practice to study you know, the area of, of physiology or self-regulation, and here are three upcoming events. Thank you. <laughs>